Hi, I'm Mark Fletcher, Avaya's Public Safety Solutions Manager, and this is Enterprise Next Generation 911 for MLTS. New innovations and solutions for the enterprise. Do you know where and when the first 911 call was made from? You may think it was New York, or Los Angeles, or was it Detroit, or maybe Atlanta? It actually was a little town of Haleyville, Alabama, on February 16, 1968, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, when the small, independent Alabama telephone company beat out corporate giant AT&T in delivering the very first 911 call. Some 44 years later, our numbers have gotten much larger. According to the National Emergency Number Association, there are in excess of 240 million calls to 911 placed each and every year. Based on statistical data provided by the PSAPs and the Avaya Public Safety Solutions team, it is estimated that about 10 to 12 percent of these 911 calls originate from multi-line telephone systems, or MLTS, used in businesses, education, or other government facilities. Given the previous total volume of 911 calls, that would indicate MLTS systems are responsible for originating more than 25 million calls each and every year. Another alarming statistic, recently published by the California Public Utilities Commission's draft decision for MLTS legislation requirements, was that 70% or more of businesses, government facilities, and schools need some level of remediation to address their E911 readiness. Supporting this number was data provided by Avaya, based on customer interaction, and CalNINA, the California chapter of the National Emergency Number Association, which represented the PSAP community and information based on actual call volumes. Next Generation 911 is the next evolution in emergency call handling and will enable a multitude of new modalities to reach 911. The Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, that was signed into law by the President in February of 2012, included rider legislation. That legislation is known as the Next Generation 911 Advancement Act, and this act makes millions of dollars in cascading funds available for the design and delivery of the Next Generation 911 network in the United States. The FCC also issued a notice of inquiry where they asked the industry to comment on the availability of location reporting, specifically for MLTS, and the response to this inquiry by industry experts, including Avaya and Nina, specifically stated that MLTS location capabilities are feasible and the FCC should begin a proceeding to establish a time frame for mandatory implementation. This next evolution of emergency services doesn't come without challenges. There are significant deltas between what we have today and what the target vision for tomorrow is. Specifically, today we're limited to voice. Tomorrow, we need a solution capable of voice, SMS, text, video, data, email, and instant messaging. Today, location information is static and correlated to a phone number, which only might represent a location. Tomorrow, we'll use device-initiated geospatial information that can provide emergency call takers with specific location coordinates based on X, Y, as well as Z, which would represent altitude. That's something that's very important in a high-rise building, for example. Today, the reach of the emergency network is extremely localized, with minimal connectivity outside of its boundaries. Tomorrow, the Emergency Services IP network will be designed to span geographic and political boundaries, providing a true network of networks, not unlike the topology of the Internet, but using a managed and resilient data backbone. And finally, today, our public safety networks are closed and use proprietary or locally adopted protocols. Tomorrow, the detailed functional and interface specification for the NINA I3 solution will define, using open standards, an environment that allows agencies to communicate across borders, whether they be city, county, state, or even international. Before we look at how 911 will operate in a next generation environment, we need to understand clearly how 911 operates today. What exactly happens when I dial 911 from my MLTS PBX telephone system? 
specific station caller ID is transmitted by the MLTS PBX to the local exchange carrier. The LEC then passes the call and the caller ID to the 911 selective router or tandem, where it is routed to a specific PSAP and the automatic location information is then retrieved. Since each individual number can have its own unique entry in the Alley database, sending a specific number can trigger a specific Alley record to be displayed to the 911 call taker. Unfortunately, in many cases and for many reasons, specifically on 911 calls, the LEC will perform what is typically called call screening on the number presented to the PSAP. What this means is that the caller ID or the telephone number that was transmitted with the call is removed and replaced with a billing telephone number. When the call reaches the PSAP, the address record for the main billing telephone number is then displayed instead of the individual station record. Another problem that can occur is the MLTS PBX can inadvertently transmit an invalid caller ID. In this case, once again, the LEC will remove the erroneous data, replacing it with a billing telephone number. Why is this done? Well, the answer is quite simple, really. The telephone company is responsible for delivering 911 calls to the PSAP. Telephone circuit and number information from residences was always considered as trusted since the data came from service order changes at the telephone company. But with the advent of PRI services, MLTS PBX systems now acquired the ability to actually send specific caller ID, and because of misprovisioning and the criticality of 911, the LEC has decided that the easiest way to fix this was to force the billing telephone numbers on calls to 911. But this never took into consideration technology evolution and user mobility. Yesterday's fix to the problem was to implement some automation inside the enterprise that would detect a user move, add, or change. New location information could then be established and then transmitted and managed in the carrier's private switch automatic location identification or PS Alley database. Now, although this was considered a fix to the problem, several issues continued to exist. The first was call screening. If the carrier modified the calling line ID from its station-specific information to the main billing telephone number, my reference to my individual record in the PS Alley database is lost. But beyond that, although updates can be made daily, they typically took 48 to 96 hours to become active in the LEC database. And this is through the validation phase that they must go through before they're entered into that critical database. Also, batch processing of the information typically happened at the end of the day and after hours and was not real-time in nature. So because of these delays in processing, it's not considered functional enough for nomadic users. Finally, the solution offered little to no support for remote work-at-home VPN users. So in an effort to improve and correct yesterday's fix, a technology that was used by the cellular industry called Dynamic PS Alley was implemented to provide more immediacy to the public database record update. Unfortunately, this required additional charges and automation on the carrier side of the problem or potentially a gateway product at the PBX, which in many cases can be a single point of failure and could actually block 911 calls if not deployed in redundant pairs. That effectively doubles the cost of that solution. In order to fix the 911 problem in the enterprise, you need to understand and manage location granularity. Now, granularity is measured in two specific places. The first is external location granularity, or the granularity that the public safety answer point, where the 911 call taker is, sees. This is where many administrators become confused as to what level of detail is required. A 911 call taker or dispatcher has, as their primary job, a duty to dispatch help when and where needed. The information that is most critical at this particular point is the response address. This allows responders to immediately start heading in the right direction. Additional details that are important at this point are a building entrance identifier or potentially a floor indicator. But keep in mind that this additional information may not be critical. 
Depending on the presence and availability of internal first responders or the ability to convey this information directly to public safety upon their arrival to the scene. After all, I can only get the fire truck or ambulance as close as the front door. Here's an example. 911 is your emergency police, fire, or medical? Medical. I'm having chest pains. Okay, stay calm. We're on the way. Where are you located in the building? I'm wearing blue socks. Now, you might be asking yourself, what does that have to do with anything? And my response to you is telling the dispatcher that you're in cubicle 2C231 has about the same value, as the call taker has no idea what your cubicle in the building means, nor do first responders, nor do they have floor plans or maps that can correlate this data. So you have to ask yourself, why am I spending all this extra money and going through all of this extra work to provide people with information that they don't really need or can't use? This is where internal location granularity comes into play. Today, new affordable technology exists that can provide information to designated personnel on site, such as emergency response teams, designated safety officers, or building security when someone places a 911 call inside the facility. Information about the device and its location can be provided in addition to floor plans, hazmat information, or even a proxy to an IP-enabled video feed. But what about after hours? Well, many new applications can also provide this output to a wall display that can be located in the lobby of the building very inexpensively. In addition to providing the general public information during the day, it can provide detailed location information during emergencies to public safety first responders when local resources are not available. This very same concept has been in use for years with fire alarm panels that indicate which sprinkler or smoke detector has been activated. Public safety already understands this model and just needs to be advised that it's now available for 911 calls. Device mobility is the real issue with Enterprise 911. Understanding where devices are located is the most important piece of information. If a device location is known, then operational decisions can be applied based on predetermined rules. Nomadic behavior can be seen in, in almost any device today. Even TDM devices, although static most of the time, may provide users with virtual office login capabilities. This effectively changes the service parameters about the device based on who's using it. Voice over IP devices are problematic because of the user's ability to move them without administrative intervention. Wireless LAN devices are constantly on the move as an inherent function of their technology. And one of the most problematic scenarios today is remote VPN teleworkers. Not only is their location nomadic in nature, in many cases it is difficult, if not impossible, to achieve any level of forensics on the remote network that they're attached to to determine the location. Fortunately, the Enterprise MLTS PBX today can provide functionality such as on-site notification, proper call routing, and the appropriate caller ID or any manipulation based on the location of the device. Even remote teleworkers can manage their location information through the use of dynamic web-based location dashboards, specifically designed for 911 mobility external to the enterprise network. If you do nothing or send the main billing address on a 911 call, this is what an emergency responder will see when using that basic street address information. The main question to ask yourself is, where is the 911 caller? This exact situation was the primary reason why first responders were not able to locate the Gaithersburg, Maryland office worker that died several years ago. Public safety had responded to the main office, which was across the street from his location. In the end, he was found, but it was some 10 hours later by the cleaning person, and unfortunately, he ended up not making it. The real shame here was that emergency responders were on scene within four to six minutes well within the accepted window of being able to save someone's life. At that company, knowing that a 911 call was placed and from where could have changed the outcome of this tragic event. Unfortunately, this is something that we'll never know for sure. Another thing to be careful of is providing too much information. Things to remember when planning your 911 zones, most PS Alley services are limited to 20 characters or less. 
Be brief, but descriptive. Establish what is important during the initial response. It probably isn't the cubicle number. On-site notification allows you to react immediately. Then, when public safety arrives on scene, correct and current information can then be conveyed to responders. Let's take a look at a situation that occurred in August of 2012. A large fire in a Chevron refinery got out of control out in California and caused an explosion. Here's how the call went on that particular incident. Hey, Chevron. Hello, we have a fire in a process unit for crude. I don't know what that means, but okay. Uh, we got a process unit coming to gate 31. It'll be a first, first level response for you guys. Okay, what does that mean? How many do you need? It's whatever, I, what you guys got, like... Like a single alarm? Like a good structure fire? Um, whatever your structure is for us, I think it's like three inches in a truck. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. What went wrong here is that the company used a description of the area that meant nothing to the 911 call taker. They also used other jargon, such as, it'll be a first-level response, another term unknown by public safety for this particular incident. This is one of the reasons why I say that internal policies and procedures need to be vetted with local public safety, and in a situation like this, should be practiced. This is the only way that you're going to ensure everyone is reading from the same playbook and that everyone understands what is being required from them as part of the emergency response team. Now, could technology have helped out a little bit here? Absolutely, yes. Detailed information could have been sent automatically by the fire alarm system directly to the 911 center. However, despite that, it was the lack of communications between the internal agency and public safety that really came under scrutiny. So the big question now is, how does Next Generation 911 fix all of these problems? And how do I, as an enterprise administrator, implement it? The answer is simple. And of course, it's got an acronym. Presence Information Data Format Location Object or PitaFlow. The important part of this are the last two words. Location Object. This is information about where the emergency event is located and resources where additional information lives that can be queried by whoever is interested in getting it. The key element in the enterprise moving forward becomes what is known as the ELM server. Now that's not the name of a specific product, it's, it's what we call a functional element on the network. It's a device or mechanism that provides specific function to your local area network similar to a DHCP server that provides IP addresses to devices or a DNS server that provides domain name resolution. The ELM provides information about users, devices, location, environmental data, as well as event correlation. Event correlation could be the examination of temperature sensors in an area that a 911 call was generated from or the correlation of other data coming from an intelligent building. A good example of event correlation would be a user dialing 911 to report a fire. Before the 911 call taker answers, the user drops the phone and leaves because of the excessive heat. Today, that's a dead air 911 call that needs to be investigated. But correlating that 911 call with temperature sensors in the area could provide important additional information, indicating a high heat condition. That can deliver additional contextual data that indicates there's an emergent condition and ultimately speed response by public safety as well as internal first responders from the enterprise. Next Generation 911 is about connecting public safety to the event and connecting the event to public safety. It's about providing additional situational awareness about an emergent event. Situational awareness is defined as being aware of what's happening around you and understanding how information and events in your own actions will impact your goals and objectives, both now and in the near future. Lack of situational awareness is one of the primary factors in accidents attributed to human error. So imagine how a firefighter may change their response to a scene knowing well in advance where the fire was located in the building by using an application that provided them with a heat map based on information received from IP-enabled temperature sensors. Or how important medical data could be conveyed directly to paramedics or doctors responding using wireless IP-enabled AED devices.
or how a police officer decides how to approach a bank robbery in progress, knowing in advance where the suspect is and if they're armed. These are just a few of the reasons of why we need Next Generation 911, as well as the additional data and situational awareness that comes along with it. One of the first questions people ask is, what is the legislative landscape like? Like any good legal answer, the answer is, it depends. As of right now, only 18 states have a reference to MLTS PBX systems, and none of those states have a penalty for noncompliance, with the exception of Michigan, but that doesn't go into effect for another four and a half years. Now, many will argue that OSHA maintains that you have to maintain a safe workplace. And some like to argue that it can be proven that if employees are not able to dial 911 in the event of an emergency, that the workplace is not a safe work environment. Now, the likelihood of OSHA shutting you down because your telephone system didn't properly handle a 911 call is probably slim to none. Although, should they decide to make an example of how a company didn't handle 911 properly, the fines can be enormous. Is it worth taking the chance? Well, the real problem is liability. We live in a very litigious environment today, and it wouldn't be difficult for an employee to prove that the lack of 911 or the delayed response caused by how 911 was programmed was a contributing factor to an injury. And what that's going to do is put you in front of a jury of their peers who may force you to dig deep into your pockets. Because we now have the ability of delivering detailed location information via SIP with the call, the Annie and Alley databases are no longer required. Now, they'll still exist, but that information will be very static and out of date. Why? Because real-time information can now be referenced from the enterprise placing the 911 call. Implementing an Elm server today and providing the URL in your existing Annie Alley records today can enable this technology to provide floor plans, environmental data, video feeds, hazmat material safety data sheets, or even personal medical information if the user allowed it. And that can be done today, even on a legacy network environment. And when a next generation 911 network is available in your area, you can send the information directly. So whatever solution that you buy today must be ready to take on this new role in the future. Make sure that you're not buying legacy fire sale technology. Ask your vendors for their next generation 911 roadmap and make sure that that roadmap makes sense to you. Avaya has worked closely with all of our DevConnect partners and the select product community of DevConnect has responded with enhanced on-site notification solutions and Elm servers for the enterprise environment. Screen pops, beacon alerts, email, SMS, forced printing, integration with external applications like Facebook and Twitter are all now capable through these third-party DevConnect select product solutions. As we flatten and consolidate and extend our network presence, 911 trunking, or hosted 911 from a carrier perspective, may be required because of the lack of local trunking where your remote users are located. This is provided through a VPC, or Voice over IP Positioning Center, and the Avaya Select partner delivering this functionality is 911 ETC. All DevConnect solutions are available on devconnectmarketplace.com, where you can search on E911. There you'll find our select product partners that provide ELM solutions and hosted 911, as well as a full list of our technology partners and their accreditation levels. Avaya takes great pride in participating nationally on several fronts. The Federal Communications Commission Emergency Access Advisory Committee is defining next-generation 911 functionality and standards, enabling hearing and speech disabled callers to contact public safety using multimedia mechanisms that bring them on par with everyday citizens who can call 911. Our CEO, Kevin Kennedy, serves on the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Council, which provides strategic direction and guidance when it comes to providing a resilient communications infrastructure for the nation's public safety community. Extending the concept of a national 911 network to the first responders in the field, Avaya is proud to be an active participant in the national communication system defining the nationwide next generation public safety broadband network, or NIPSPIN. Avaya takes public safety seriously, and employees maintain active memberships with several international industry forums. 
our subject matter experts maintain the NENA ENP certification and contribute on several key standards and committees, including the National Public Safety Broadband Network Scoping Subcommittee, the MLTS PBX Model Legislation Committee, Next Generation 911 ESI Net Design, Next Gen 911 Additional Data Work Group, and the Next Generation 911 Transition Plan. We also participate in Europe, providing input on the ENA eCall Operations document, their version of OnStar, and other multilingual call taker standards and guidance. We believe that education is the key tenant behind Avaya's public safety presence. Information about our public safety solutions is available at www.avaya.com forward slash public safety and we maintain weekly industry-leading podcasts and blogs that demonstrate our mindshare and technical acumen across the portfolio. That's available at www.avaya.com forward slash Fletcher. We appreciate you listening to this webinar today, and feel free to contact your Avaya account representative for detailed explanations and additional technical information. I'm Mark Fletcher. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.